Hi, uh, my name is Kanaka Rajan. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the Friedman Brain Institute um, in the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, I'm a computational neuroscientist, and today I'm going to be talking about um, new work in my lab that I'm very excited about. Um, it's, it's funded mainly through the Brain Initiative and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, the title of my talk is Multi-Region Network of Networks Models of Adaptive and Maladaptive State Transitions. Um, and before I get into the meat of my talk, I'd like to um, you know, thank my colleagues and key collaborators on the project. Uh, most of the heavy lifting on this project um, is currently being done by Matt Perrick, a postdoc in my lab. Uh, the experimental data was provided by Tyler Benster and Aaron Andelman in the Carl Dysroth lab. Uh, Camille spencer Salmon is a rock star graduate student also in my lab, and Jean Carter I would like to thank also for their contributions to this project. Um, I would also like to thank our funding sources, uh, primarily um, the Brain Initiative, which has been, um, which, you know, and we thank them for their faith in our work. Um, okay, so in life, um, behaviors or, you know, we constantly evaluate whether, you know, we, we constantly evaluate whether the actions that we're about to perform are worth the effort we expend in performing these actions, right? And so, you know, every decision we make involves evaluating among these actions for, you know, their, their worthiness. Now, if actions repeatedly fail to yield fruit or are repeatedly fruitless, then you become, you know, disappointed. This is, you know, just... And in the extreme, this can manifest as hopelessness. So the maladaptive state of discounting actions or considering them all fruitless because they've constantly been fruitless, perhaps through experience, um, is, you know, is hopelessness. And hopelessness is one of the hallmarks of clinical depression. And you'll see that thread continuing throughout my talk. Now, hopelessness is seen in many animals and across diverse nervous systems with various architectures complexity as well as different kinds of um, sampling. So here are some experiments um, primarily done in rodents, which is called a four swim paradigm, in which a rodent is placed in a, um, in a small jar of water with no perch for it to get on. So initially, it tries to escape this adverse scenario by swimming vigorously, trying to escape this. And then eventually, it g gives up and doesn't swim as vigorously anymore. So the initial phase when it swims vigorously to avoid this strenuous um, or stressful experience is called active coping. And later on, when the animal looks as though it has given up and reduces its movement away from this adverse, um, ad, you know, this adverse situation, is called passive coping. Now, active and passive coping lie on two ends of a behavioral spectrum. Um, and so it is exactly this type of transition between active coping and passive coping that I'm going to be talking about from a theoretical perspective. Um, and so, you know, if passive coping occurs earlier than normal, then, you know, it's a maladaptive condition. And, you know, interventions have been shown to dilate the onset of passive coping. Now, as I mentioned, most of this, you know, study of passive coping has been studied in, 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 in rodents. And so mouse neurobiology is a very vast, there's a vast literature on mouse neurobiology in passive coping and in similar states. And so here's a little list of a few papers that um, that on the subject. And what I would like to highlight here is these two regions, once the habenula and once the raphe. And I'd like to, you know, like you to put a pin in this thought because we're going to return to these regions over and over again. Now, mouse neurobiology is very complex and that even with current neurotechnological advances, we can only access a very small fraction, which, you know, leads to partial sampling issues. So enter a nervous system with more access, namely the larval zebrafish. Now, larval zebrafish not only provides unprecedented access to potentially every neuron in its brain, but its nervous system has homologies with the mammalian system. Primarily, again, if you notice in the slide, um, in, this, in the schematic, you can see the habenula and the raphe highlighted both in the fish at the top and the mammalian system at the bottom. And there's a few papers also, um, including from our collaborators' labs, um, studying you know, um, the larval zebrafish as an exquisite um, experimental system with enormous access.
So one of the questions, a big question that my lab is interested in, almost like a research program, is are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved when you go from a, from a smaller nervous system to a larger nervous system? And which ones, which of these circuit mechanisms are different when you go from you know, a smaller nervous system to a larger nervous system? Let's say from larval zebrafish to rodents to macaques to even humans. These are very interesting directions, but for the purposes of today's talk, I would like to narrow this question down to just this one. Namely, what circuit changes mediate the state transition from active to passive coping in the larval zebrafish? And so to get at this question, I turn to experiments again. So these are experiments that were designed by Aaron Andelman in the Dyserath lab. Um, and he designed a stress paradigm or a behavioral challenge paradigm for this model system. So larval zebrafish are exposed to roughly one hertz weak electrical shocks. So initially, when the shock comes on, as you see in this little schematic here, the fish, um, you know, vigorously whip their tails and try to get away from the stressful stimulus. But this should remind you a little bit of the active coping phase. Now, these stresses don't stop coming just because the fish um, whipped its tail. So in other words, it's persistent and it's inescapable. So eventually, over a period of about a half hour or so in this behavioral challenge period, um, larval zebra fish that were previously actively coping now lapse into passive coping or roughly immobile state. Now, in the Dyseroth lab, technological advances are uh, enable us to have access to the real-time tail trajectories tracked on a moment-by-moment -moment basis throughout the experience. And, that's, um, and, and the result of that monitoring is plotted here. So here on the y-axis is the, is the movements averaged across different cohorts of fish plotted as a function of time in the experiment. In black, you should see control, that is the average of the tail movements of the control fish, and in blue, the shocked fish. And you can see that in the initial periods of the shock, which are highlighted in this very faint pink bar here, that the shocked fish exhibit an enhancement in the tail movements as if to avoid the adversity. And that is the active coping phase. Eventually, however, when the stress is persistent and inescapable, you can see that, they, that the movement of the shocked fish drop well below the, that of the control fish eventually ceasing. And that's what you see in the second part of the experiment here, or passive coping. So it's these two behavioral transitions that I'm interested in understanding the mechanisms of. So experiments here are not only limited to the behavioral readout, but also um, cellular resolution monitoring of the entire brain of the larval zebrafish. So they've expressed a nuclear localized GCAMP which means that every ROI that you'll see in a video that I'll show you in a second um, is, is really a neuron. So they can image from between 10,000 to 40,000 neurons per fish during the entire experiential state while also tracking its behavior. So this is quite an exquisite data set. And this is sort of what one of the stills from the video looks like. Um, and so if we may have um, up for that, I can show the audience what um, what what you know these videos of these larval zebrafish look like while they're being imaged. So, at the, so this is a still from the same video that you saw before. The bottom part of the slide is the exact same schematic, a simplified schematic of the experimental paradigm showing the stresses building up and the fish lapsing from active coping to passive coping. And on the top left, you see the averages of the, the average tail movement across these cohorts of fish. Okay, so looking at these types of activity patterns, um, Aaron did, you know, Aaron did a lot of uh, clever clustering of these types of a tiny bit. Um, two features popped out of the out of just the measurements alone, and those are as follows. The first main neural finding or finding from the population activity from the experimental data was that as the stress is built up, the activity in the habenula seemed to ramp up. 
So what you see here on the extreme left is, you know, a, um, a schematic of the fish with the um, with the habenula highlighted, and you see the average activity or the delta F over the over F averaged over all of the fish plotted as a function of time. In black again is control, and in blue is the shock. And you can see that in the in the um, and, and you can see that, you know, in the habenula, the activity seems to rise steadily throughout the experiment. And the dashed line at zero is the time at which the first shock came on. So now if you decouple your eyeballs a little bit, you can sort of imagine that there's like a little phase going on in the beginning part of the habenula activation. There's a little bump maybe, and then it, there's the steady ramping of activity. Uh, but, you know, there, that's the first finding. The second finding from the experiment alone was that there's a suppression of activity in the raffae. Now, remember I told you in the beginning of the talk that the habenula and the raffae are going to be the linchpins around which the, around which the talk is, um, is organized. And so, so they find activity in the raffae. Again, this is the average delta F over F for all of the fish. Zero marks the time of the onset of the shocks. And the raffae in the shocked fish seems to be... Um, exhibiting an inhibitory response as shocks keep building up. With that, I'd like to return to the question that I set out in the beginning of the talk, which is, well, what circuit changes mediate the state transition from active to passive coping? So from measurements, all we knew is that the habenula ramped up and the raffae went down. So the mechanisms behind which these two um, findings, um, the mechanisms underlying these two findings, and then how these two findings um, at the whole brain level influence the behavioral state transition from active to passive coping, that's what I mean by asking what circuit changes or what mechanisms underlie this transition. And so for that, my approach is going to be um, to build to build, and then to reverse engineer neural network models that are that are built directly using the time series measurements from the experiment as constraints. And so what do I mean by that, right? So before I get into how I build these networks and what we'll get from them, basically we get stuff that are inaccessible for measurements alone. I'd like to take a minute and tell you the very basics of what goes on in these networks and how we build them. Okay, so this is the basic network design. And so this is a rate, this is a schematic of a rate-based recurrent neural network or RNN. And I have schematized this so that each unit is symbolized in the blue spheres connected by what I hope are randomly um, random weights or randomly initialized. And so I have studied networks like this before um, in a set of Paper's graduate career uh, collaboration with Larry Abbott and Heinz Ompolinsky. And each unit in networks like this follows a first order differential equation. So these networks give um, you know, a certain mathematical elegance to, um, to how we formulate the, the, the basic building blocks of neural networks in the brain. And so you can understand everything you need to know about these networks if you knew the firing rates or some kind of continuous activity of each unit, and if you knew the weights with which or the strengths with which each pair of units interacted in these networks. And that's kind of what this equation symbolizes over time. So here, I'll just walk you through very quickly what these terms are. Networks like this can exhibit, can uh, can be exposed to external inputs. Um, I should mention that in our case, we present um, in you know when I'm building networks that are similar to the data that are uh, from a shocked fish, then these external inputs I designed would be, you know, imagine that they're pulses, right? Square wave pulses presented with the exact same timing as the experimenter presents in the experiment. Um, but here I've just, you know, um, symbolized them with, 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 with the traces that you see in orange. Now, um, what you see here is phi is the FI curve or the activation function. And you can pick your favorite saturating nonlinearity here. Uh, and the key thing to notice here is that networks like this, their activity is governed by this matrix, which I've called J in the mathematical equation, and I'm calling them directed interactions here. And these symbolize the strength of the interaction and the direction of the interaction between every pair of neurons in this model network. And so if I were to say every neuron is literally a neuron and every weight is directly a synapse, then this will collapse into the synaptic connectivity matrix. But I'm trying to keep this as general as possible. So I'm just going to call them directed interactions. 
Now, I this is a very basic network design that doesn't correspond to anything that occurs in the fish. And so I can start networks at this place by filling or populating this directive interaction matrix with elements that are drawn from a Gaussian distribution that looks like this. So here I've written down the probability of, of, an, uh, of an element as a function of its strength centered at zero um, and with a variance with a variance scaled as this number g squared over the network size. And so this is a very basic network design that I'm going to take um, as a starting point and change in two ways. The first I do is to take networks like this, and this is a schematic of exactly the same thing that I showed you before, a single region model and the directed interaction matrix from it. And I can um, extend it to symbolize the interactions within and between two regions in the brain. So this is a region RNN model. There's two regions here in, um, that I've symbolized here in the schematic. Consequently, its directed interaction matrix becomes slightly more complex. So here you see these two squares along the block, along the diagonal or block diagonal matrix. Uh, those symbolize the strength of the interactions or directions of the interactions within each of these regions that are symbolized as region one and region two. And the across diagonal elements symbolize the interactions between these regions or the inter area projections. You can play this game further potentially to the whole brain and get a multi region RNN. And here I'm showing you four out of the possible 15 that we can do for the larval zebrafish because that's how many regions that we have access to data from. And for a four region model like this, the directed interaction matrix acquires an even more complex structure where again, the interactions within the region are symbolized in the blocks that you see going across the principal diagonal and the interactions or inter area communication weights are in the off diagonal elements. So that's the first thing we do. We take that first basic random network and we add complexity to it by wiring more of them together. The second thing we do is to take the activity of each unit in this model network and train it to match calcium data directly. And so what I'm doing here is to tell you what I told you before, which is how to train these models by, by time series measurements a priori. So that's what I'm trying to tell you here. So, so what you see here in red on the right-hand side is the input current to one unit. Um, here, and I'm going to match it directly to a target, which in this case is going to be the calcium activity recorded from that neuron, from its partner neuron in the experimental data set. And the linear difference between those two quantities will drive the update for the entire directed interaction matrix. This learning rule is called recursive least squares. There's a lot of foundational work based on this. Um, and, you know, for, for, for the purposes of the fish, uh, what should appear now on the right-hand side of the screen is basically telling you that I build, to start, I'm building networks that are as big as the size of the experimental data set. So if I'm building a whole brain network with 15 regions interconnected, then there'll be a order 10 to the four neurons or model units in this, in this model fish RNN that I built. Okay, so you know, let's say we're, we managed to pull this off, right? And, and, and we have done this quite profitably in a number of papers that you can see here. So we can use this trick to you know, train networks just to behave or you know, just uh, to match the behavioral data from real experiments. And I've written papers on that subject. We can also train these networks so that their units inside match neural dynamics that are empirically observed. And I've written papers on that too, including um, the one that appeared in Cell recently. Okay, so you know this exercise produces a network where the weights have now been changed so as to reflect the activity of the experimental data directly, right? So what does this exercise buy you? Do we really have a system that is as complex as the original system we set out to, um, set out to match? And what this exercise buys you are three things that should appear now. The first thing is that a multi-region RNN model like this, once trained, will produce realistic neural dynamics very similar to that observed experimentally once the training is stopped. So we're not fitting a curve necessarily. What we're doing is building a dynamical system that once you set it up in the initial condition will autonomously produce the dynamics similar to experimental data. 
It lets us infer consistent brain-wide directed interactions, which I'm symbolizing here by this uh, J with the superscript M for model. And so it lets you infer connectivity both within brain regions and across brain regions in this trained connectivity matrix or directed interaction matrix. The third thing you get, which you can't get from experiment, from measurements alone, is that is the product of the first two, which is the currents, or the currents due to recurrent connections within and between regions. And so I'm gonna talk about you know, the implications of all this, but let me you know, wind this back and show you the proof of principle in the two region model. So here's a two region model in which region one is the habenula, region two is the raphe, meaning that the model units in the habenula like RNN are trained to match data from the real habenula of a fish, and the model units in the raphe like RNN are trained to match the units in the raphe from the real experiment, and they're both interconnected. And so what you see now at the bottom is the mean squared error of the learning algorithm as a function of the number of learning steps. It's a very standard way of showing that, yes, these networks can be trained. And this shows that as learning steps progress, the mean squared error goes down and the network is able to match the data. Here's some more evidence of that. So I'm showing you now six example neurons from the, from the habenula at the top and the raphe at the bottom. In all of these traces, data, like the real experimental delta F over F is in blue the model's output for that particular neuron is in red. And so the first column is control fish. The second column is, um, is examples from, uh, from an RNN that was trained to match data from a shocked fish. And you can see, look, in these examples at least, that the network does a very good job of matching the experimental data. So now just to assure you that I didn't cherry pick you know, these six neurons in particular, we, I can also show you that uh, overall the population dynamics are also quite faithfully replicated. So on the left now, you should see state-space analysis. On top is the control fish, and the bottom is uh, data from a network that was trained to match control fish. And so what I'm doing is taking the entire activity of the habenula raphe RNN in the bottom and projecting it into the dominant three or the largest three principal components at the top in the data and at the bottom in the model. And you can see it kind of matches the overall flavor of the population dynamics. This is true of the control fish as well as data from the, from the shocked fish. Okay, so this works, right? Of course it, it works because that's what we're training the network to do. But here's really the key. Networks like this, we have trained, but we have access to the guts of them. So once you train these artificial networks to match data like I'm doing here, we can open up the hood and look, what's, look at what mechanisms or circuit motifs drive the activity that you see once the network is trained. So what these give you, the first thing is the directed interaction matrix, right? So in this case, it gives you this uh, schematic that you see here now. Presynaptic uh, or pre-connections are um, along the column, or the rows. In that's highlighted in red should be the connections within the habenula. In the block that's highlighted in green should be the connections within the raphe. And the across diagonal elements should be the connections going from habenula to raphe and raphe to habenula respectively. And so what is the property, the overall property of a network uh, of, of the directed interaction matrix derived from this two region RNN looks like. And that's what I'm showing you here. So I'm taking the probability density or the, or the histogram, the, the probability density of the elements within this entire matrix. And I'm taking the log of it because the ranges of them um, were too large. And I'm plotting them as a function of the interaction strengths. So in gray is the, is the matrix from matrix trained on data from a control fish. And in blue is a matrix trained matrix from an RNN that was trained on data from a shocked fish. And already you can can see that in going from control condition to shock condition, this is towards the last part of the experiment, right? There's an expansion in scales. Now, just as a matter of comparison, the very first thing I showed you was this random initial matrix. That would be a very, very small Gaussian um, right in the middle. So you can see even the act of training it on a control fish expands its range, but going from control to shocked fish already has a massive expansion in scales. Again, the y-axis is in log units. The main takeaway from this 
is that, well, okay, so the mean did not change significantly in going from the control to the shocked fish. So we wanted to track the other moments of the probability distribution, namely the standard deviation, the kurtosis, and the skewness. Again, skewness wasn't particularly informative in this case. What this means is that rather than being rather than being driven by random connections spread throughout the network, tuning in the habenular raphe you know, double circuit in the brain of the larval zebrafish appears to be driven by very few, very large synapses, which is what is symbolized, which is what um, manifests in the in the heavy tailedness of these distributions. So the large connections are also the rare ones. And this is a motif that you'll see over and over again in, in, um, in the nervous system of, of many animals. So this is the overall connectivity of the habenular raphe um, to region RNN. I wanted to see, well, what happens if you look at these blocks independently? And here's what we find. The biggest changes come from the habenula. So that's what you see here, right? So right now I'm splitting the, 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 connect, the overall connectivity matrix into four blocks, and you see the probability distribution of the one that's highlighted in red on the top. So again, it's log probability density as a function of interaction strength. And you see that the expansion that you hear in going from control to shock is driven a lot by the, by the habenula, and it goes in the right direction in that the habenular connections seem to be strengthened as a function of the shocks, which again correlates with the main experimental finding in the beginning, which was that habenular activity did seem to ramp up. So perhaps this underlies, this probably points to a mechanism or probably a consequence of what happens when the habenular activity is ramping, probably manifests as a strengthening of the connections within the habenula. Then we looked at the connections within the RAFE, and okay, there's a very small kind of difference in going from control to shocked fish, goes in the right direction relative to the experimental data observed, but I wasn't you know, moved to tears by it. Then we looked at the connections going from the habenula to the RAFE, which is a known projection, and those did not appear to be significantly different in going from the control to the shocked. But here's the unexpected response, right? Here's the one, here's the unexpected connection or finding that the models spat out that we weren't expecting before. That there was also a strengthening of the connections going from the raffe back into the habenula. There's only very, very little um, empirical evidence of there even being such a connection going from raffe feeding back into the habenula. Um, in these two papers that I've listed here. But this is a finding that the model that we are now in the process of testing in collaboration with the Dysroth lab in a set of new optogenetics experiments, which have been designed basically to test the predictions of a model that we published in Cell. And I think this speaks to one of the stated goals of the BRAIN initiative is to fund projects like these, in which the model not only analyzes existing data and leverages it more than measurements could, but then the model's findings could design the next generation of experiments, which will then recursively modify our model if needed or falsify its findings. So it's exactly, you know, this place exactly to the stated purpose of, um, of the BRAIN initiative. And this finding, the projections from the RAFE to the habenula and the connections uh, strengthening within the habenula, those two motifs seem to hold over multiple fish. And so here's you know five fish from the control condition and five fish from the shocked condition. And I'm showing you the percent changes in the standard deviation of these of the probability distributions, because as I mentioned, the means were not significantly different. And so this was the moment that we needed to track. And so again, here you should see that the top two, which are the within habenula and the rafe to habenula projections, seem to be strengthened in going from the control condition to the shocked condition. So this is like the first part of my talk. And, you know, we have access, you know, 15 regions in the larval zebrafish, right? And so this is the kind of analysis that we can do um, for any pairwise combination of, of out of those 15. But we wanted to say, well, what else can we do, right? Can we rule out the impact of, let's say, common inputs into the habenular raffi network? Um, you know, so the mental model that we were working with originally was that, okay, the shocks come in, the 
Habenula says bad stuff's happening, ramps up its activity. Rafe says, okay, cavalry is here, worry no more. Then if the serotonin dump from the Rafe did not make you feel better, then someone had to shut the movement down. Now it's in, so infralimbic cortex, which is a part of the prefrontal cortex, is implicated um, in mammalian systems to be the mediator that shuts down movement when learned helplessness, or in our case, passive coping, um, it, it is meant to take place. And so one of the goals for us was to say, OK, can we find an infralimbic cortex-like region out of the 15 in the larval zebrafish? And so I'm going to already tell you that we went, so our findings are not exactly in line with this hypothesis. Um, but, you know, it's led us in a, in, a, in a very, very interesting direction nonetheless. So we wanted to extend what we've done so far and add telencephalon to this. And telencephalon was one of the nodes in the uh, in the data set with a large number of units. So this would, you know, potentially give us the opportunity to disentangle the role of common inputs when you're trying to figure out connectivity and directionality between these two regions, as well as probably give us a lead into what could be playing the role of an infralimbic-like movement shutdown region. And so we did exactly the same thing as I told you before, except now we built a three-region neural network model, and each unit was now matched to uh, a target function, either from the Habenula or the Rafe or the Telencephalon, depending on which um, which um, network which network was it was meant to replicate in the real brain of the larval zebrafish. So again, just like before, this exercise would give you dynamics that was similar to data once it was trained. It would also give you directed interactions inside the trained matrix, except now it would have connections within the habenula, the raphe, and the telencephalon going along the diagonal. And across the two diagonals would be the pairwise connections um, between these regions or inter-area communication principles. And yes, we have done the analysis like I've shown you before, where we've tracked the different moments over the experiment. But I'm going to tell you, um, you know, sort of almost the, the direction that we're really the most excited about in this. Which is product of the two. So the product of the two gives you the following, right? So this is, again, the exact same schematic that you saw before. It gives you the recurrent currents, right? So after matching calcium data, a network like this, as I've said before, gives you activations that are similar. And here I've schematized the directed interaction matrix here. Now, the dark product of those two objects gives you currents in the network due to the recurrent interactions. And if you recall the math from a few slides ago, it's exactly that second term on the right-hand side of the differential equation, which is a dot product of this matrix J with the activations across the network. And you can sum these over different indices, and, and that's sort of where we're building to. So, let, so this lets us look at currents from the same or from different areas so, for example, by looking at the looking at just the connections within the um, by you know looking at the dot product of just the weights within this habenula network, which I've which I've now circled in this um, in this you know orange square, I can look at you know what are the effects of the recurrent connections within the habenula on an example habenula neuron. I can do the exact same thing by looking at what are the connections. Uh, you know, what are the recurrent um, effects or the currents from the raphe into the habenula, and what are the recurrent currents from the telencephalon into the habenula? And that's what this schematic tells you, right? So this is exactly the same thing as I've shown you before, except I have now pictorially depicted the, the you know, the, the dot product. And I'm going to look at everything from the perspective of the habenula. So in, in the orange square is the habenula to habenula connection. If I restrict the rank, uh, if I restrict the, uh, the sum, I can only look at the connections from the raphe into the habenula. And if I restrict the sum another way, I can look at the uh, recurrent currents flowing from the telencephalon to the habenula. We can also do this exercise for the raphe and for the telencephalon. But for the purposes of the talk, let me just show you what happens if you look at these currents separately. And this is what the habenula to habenula currents look like. So this is an example of the currents of 
12, about 2,200 habenulum neurons in a shocked fish, which you can tell because I've put the times of the shocks in the red dots at top. And, and this is over time. And these habenulum neurons have been sorted by Matt Perrick uh, by the time at which each peaks along its row. And they've also been normalized by the mean over the entire um, over this entire data set. Now you can also look at the rapid to habenular currents. Now the neurons have been ordered in exactly the same order as they were in the habenular to habenular connections. And now this is the telencephalon to habenular uh, currents. And the, and you know you can sort of make um, you can realize some sort of activity pattern as a function of the sorting. But what I'm telling you now is rather than looking at the activity alone, the raw activity of the habenula, which is what you get from looking at measurements or by um, or as a function of the outputs of our RNNs, now we can decompose this activity into its component recurrent currents, both within the region, as I'm showing you in the habenula to habenula, or between regions, like the current flow from the raphane to the habenula or the telencephalon into the habenula. And now we can do exactly the same types of dimensionality reduction that we would have done on the activities. And uh, my postdoc, Matt Perrick, has written several papers on the subject, and this is built on foundational work from many labs. Um, and so, you know, if you did a dimensionality reduction on these three currents now, instead of the overall activity, you're left with these three axes. So in green is the raphe to habenula, the orange is habenula to habenula, and in purple is the telencephalon to the habenula. Now we can take the activity and project it into the space spanned by these three currents. And that's what this looks like. So now this is the overall trajectory of a shocked fish's dynamics, population dynamics, projected into the space spanned by these three axes. Uh, we have also overlaid the times of the times at which the shocks appear in the real experiment on top of this trace, and immediately something pops out, which is that in the early part of the shocks, as symbolized the as symbolized by the warm colors. Contrary to what we were expecting, the raphe to the habenula um, currents seem to be changing a lot, which is evidenced by the trajectory populating only that subspace. It's only later in the experiment, as evidenced by the late shocks in the colder colors, that the habenula to habenula and the telencephalon to the habenula um, subspaces are populated. So we went in looking for connections within the habenula um, or the habenula to habenula currents to be strengthened. But those don't seem to be coming online until uh, the late shock period. In fact, the early part of the shocks are driven by currents going from the raphe to the habenula. And so this kind of looking, this kind of approach of looking at manifolds that are spanning input currents, as opposed to looking at just the outputs that you can get from measurements alone, can help us now to separate things like timescales, not just sources of these currents in the network. And we're starting to say, okay, maybe the early part could correlate with the active coping phase, as you see in the behavioral diagram that should appear on the right now um, in the first half. And, um, and the later, later part or the onset to passivity could be driven by habenula to habenula and telencephalon to habenula engagement or currents flowing in. So not only are these able to demix or source separate input currents, but they could actually reveal interesting inter-area effects, such as you know differential engagements of these currents or timing or two distinct timescales in this particular case. We're now in the process of proving that this type of visualization is more informative than either looking at just the activity of the habenula neurons, which is what you see here. This is the delta. Uh, this is the activity of the habenula neurons over time. Uh, in the middle of the bottom part of the slide is the averaged population activity that you've already seen before. This is averaged over the fish, um, and. And, uh, and finally, you should see the activity of the habenula neurons or the measurements that are now projected into the three dominant principal components. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, the time scales are much more mixed or multiplexed in the traditional view. Now, to really drive this point home, we wanted to look at these, um, look at what these principal components actually look like over time. 
And so that's what you see here. The top part of the slide is identical to what you saw before. And so right, so now here's an example control fish, and I've plotted the normalized current or the first principal component as a function of time in the experiment. Um, the movements that you see here in the gray are the tail whips that have now been convolved with Gaussian. So as to just give you a visual indication of the fact that, you know, the control fish just keep waggling their tail for the duration of the entire experiment. And you see that the raphe to habenula in green, habenula to habenula in orange, and T. lencephalon to habenula in purple, the three sort of mirror each other. They're not, you know, they're not separated. Now you contrast that with the exact same plot, but now plotted um, based on activity, um, based on activity from a network that was trained on on data from a shocked fish with the shock times again early and late shocks in the dots at the top. And uh, again, now you see something very interesting happen, which is that the raphid, the habenula, seems to be mediating um, mediating the active coping phase or the initial part of the experiment by showing this little ramp. And the telencephalon to habenula and the habenula habenula currents don't seem to get engaged until after the lapse into passivity. Now, this is an example of shocked fish, right? So what you see here is the movements uh, that are overlaid on this current plot. And, you know, occasionally a fish would make an exploratory tail whip after the lapse into passivity, which is really the flat part of the movement curve. And so what this is telling you is that the currents really behave in a rather different manner than what we were originally expecting, in that the active coping phase may be driven by inputs from the raphe or the feedback inputs from the raphe into the habenula. And this finding holds even when we average across fish. And so here now on the left, you see the control condition averaged across five fish as a function of time. And this is the average movement and you see that the three currents in, you know, raphe to habenula, habenula to habenula, or telencephalon to the habenula, uh, those sort of mirror each other for the duration of the experiment. And we're still investigating what kind of drift would explain the slow ramp. Um, in the shocked fish, however, you see that this trend that I showed you in the example holds, which is that the raphe to the habenula currents seem to be engaged first. Um, mediating what we think um, by correlation with the active coping phase. And the telencephalon to the habenula and the habenula habenula currents don't engage and ramp up until after the lapse into passive coping. And so to really now prove to you that these are two distinct time scales, I want to now show you the same probability distribution um, of the raphe to the habenula currents now on the left plotted as a function of interaction strength. Again, this is in logs. And the gray and the red lines that you see here are the early part of the experiment because they are now color coded by the time of the shocks. And you see that relative to the baseline, which is gray, the red or the early part of the shocks are not that different. But it's only later in the experiment that the raphe to the habenula um, habenula connections or directed interactions strengthen, lining up exactly with the plot that I showed you in the first half of the talk. So what this actually tells you is that there are two distinct timescales at play here. The early part of the of the of the experiment or the early part of the behavior or the or the active coping phase could be driven by rotations to the current to the manifold in the currents alone from the raphe into the habenula and the later part may be driven by changes in the overall connectivity or plasticity mechanisms that control um, actual strengths of projections from, uh, let's say in this case, from the raphe into the habenula. So this is, I'm, I'm replotting what I showed you before. Um, I'm, I'm showing you again what I showed you in the bottom part of the curve before. And I'd like to return to the question that we posed at the beginning of the talk, which is, well, what circuit changes mediate the state transition from active to passive coping in the larval zebrafish? And, you know, we found two things. In the first part of the talk, I told you that habenular interaction strengthen with persistent inescapable adversity. And unexpectedly, the model popped out out a feedback interaction from the raphe into the habenula as having strengthened. The second part of the talk is you know, preliminary, but we're trying to develop this current-based decomposition analysis that reveals
ritual roles of uh, the raphe and the telencephalon projections into the hebenula. And so we, we think now that the active coping phase is driven by much faster changes to the manifolds. And then the later part of the experiment or the later part of the behavior, which is passive coping or a much slower transition, is driven by changes to the actual connectivity brain-wide or to connections to the DI matrix as uh, predicted by our model. So here are a few conclusions of what I've told you today, right? I hope I've convinced you today that we are able to build these multi-region RNN models that are capable of generating neural dynamics consistent with neural and soon behavioral data from these types of uh, behavioral experiments in general, but in this case, from the active to passive coping uh, stage transition. Networks like this are able to let us infer consistent directed interaction matrices or the connectivity matrices, which reflect both inter-area and intra or within area connections. Um, and we want to be able to figure out well, what motifs in these directed interactions correlate with the behavioral state transition or state changes. Finally, we've begun this manifold-based analysis on the currents or currents-based decomposition as, this, um, as a new method to suggest that early and um, earlier and or fast timescale and slow timescale effects can actually be teased apart by looking at currents in this, in this interesting way. And so I've also presented preliminary results from the Habenular, Raffae, Telencephalon, three-region RNN. We're currently scaling this up to the whole brain. So, Overall, I think my lab is trying to pose this type of multi-region, potentially brain-wide RNN models that are constrained from the on, at the outset from time series measurements obtained empirically and working closely with experimentalists as a viable alternative to traditional correlation-based functional connectivity analysis methods. And so we're, uh, we're currently working on a second manuscript, um, and uh, Dr. Matt Perrick is, uh, is, is the, the rock star postdoc who has been leading much of the theoretical effort on this. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention um, and, again, highlight the efforts of Matt Perrick and Camille spencer Salmon, uh, the two key drivers of the theoretical portion of this, um, of this work that I presented today. I'd like to thank Tyler Benster and Aaron Andelman from the Carl Dyseroth Lab for their generosity, um, you know, intellectual as well as experimental data, um, and for the heroic experiments that, they've, um, that they have conducted. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Brain Initiative, particularly for their support, um, um, support of this work. With Without the initiative's um, support and their faith in our approach, none of this work would have been possible. And so uh, with that, I'd like, like to thank you for your attention. And if you know any um, motivated individuals who would like to join a diverse and young group um, in investigating these types of questions um, about brain-wide mechanisms of uh, behavioral state transitions, please point them in our way. Thank you.